Welcome to Palace Confidential. It's your weekly look at all things royal, brought to you from the Mail's HQ in Kensington. I'm Joe Elvin, and after a couple of special editions, we are back with your usual program, and it's good to be here. On my panel this week, we have Kate Manzi, assistant editor of the Mail on Sunday, Charlotte Griffiths, who is the paper's editor at large, and from the Daily Mail, my TV husband and would be usurper. Daily Mail diary editor Richard Eden, welcome to you all. Um, lots to talk about from Fergie's finances to the Queen today, but we're going to kick things off with the announcement of a new book that has the potential to set the cat amongst the pigeons again at the palace, both here and in California. Uh, what can you tell us about it, Richard? This is really interesting. This is a book um, by Valentine Lowe, who's the Times' um, royal correspondent. And our viewers might remember him because he was the man who broke the story about the alleged bullying of staff yes. by Meghan. Yeah. Now that was that was a, a great story which came out I think the day before the um, explosive Oprah Winfrey interview, and it led to a sort of internal inquiry, which of course we never really heard the results from. Um, but his book is called Courtiers, and it's going to be all about sort of. The figures, the men in grey suits, you know, as Princess Diana used to call them, and we, the figures that we've have been really sort of pilloried by um, Harry and Meghan. Making that allusion to making sure the Queen has the right people around her. Exactly. That was a bit of a dig, wasn't it? Everything's yeah. always blamed on them. Yeah. So it'll be really interesting to see what Valentine Lowe's saying, and perhaps he's giving, you know, a different um, side of things. So yeah. um, hopefully, stand by for some scoops. So, Kate, the last few years have been full of behind-the-scenes turmoil and a story involving lots of stories from courtiers, that's got to be a gold mine of gossip. Well, yeah, I think we, we so often used to hearing about the principles, as they call them, the, the, the members of the royal family, but this is about the people kind of, you know, to borrow the phrase from Hamilton the musical, people who were in the room where it happened. Mm. And, yeah, I mean, often people think they're these shadowy characters, but it's a world you know, it's a fascinating world and the jobs that they have, they're really seeing kind of history in the making. So it'll be really fascinating to see what kind of, you know, details that the author brings to light with this because <clears throat> we, we've heard about things going on behind the scenes, you know, was it true, wasn't it true? And to go beyond the palace walls, I think, you know, I find that quite exciting because it's not just what we see the royals doing out in public, but what happens behind the scenes. Um, and I'm sure viewers of Palace will think that that's quite fascinating as well. I don't know whether the average reader is, is truly that interested in the men in grey suits, as Harry calls mm. them, just like his mother. Um, but certainly I am. I'm fascinated to know. But I'm curious as to what kind of sources they will be. Who's allowed to speak? Surely everybody's NDA'd up to the gills in the Palace. My understanding is that, I mean, this is Valentine Lowe, who's been covering the beat for decades. So my understanding is he has had pretty good access from speaking mm. to Val. Um, and he's a nice writer, so, you know, fair play. I look forward to reading it. Charlotte, they're, you know, there's like, they're like buses, not one, but <laughs> several at once. We've got this book, we've got Harry's biography, we've got Angela Levin's book on Camilla due out. Is there a risk that these books will distract from the royals' day-to-day -day duties and engagements? Well, I think any publicity is good publicity, and I think... <laughs> for, it depends who you ask, I think. <laughs> I bet the Queen is, doesn't think that. Well, <laughs> but Angela's is going to be very positive about Camilla, right. and would we really want to be seeing Camilla in the pages of all the papers otherwise, maybe not as much as some of the younger, more glamorous ones. Um, so I think, I think it'll be good. I think it will help focus our attention on whatever they're up to that week, royal engagement-wise. Do you think the palace are thinking, oh, God, what now? <laughs> we're the they're used to talk. this. It's been going on for decades. Yeah. People, there's always ten books a year. They're, they're, you know, they're used to it. Obviously, the Harry one, however, might be a bit of a different, uh, a different. When, when they're not normally one. the subject, <laughs> are they? So this time there must be a bit of nervousness. And I think there is a slight apprehension that you know we're going to be. They like you know being the kind of people, faceless people behind the scenes, you know, pulling the levers and things like that. The idea that they're going to be named and featured in some of these stories that are going to come to light and anecdotes that are going to come to light in the book might give them uh, yeah, give them pause for thought. I suspect the press office is probably cancelling leave for the whole of autumn, aren't they, so uh, when, when these books come yeah. out? Or all resigning, <laughs> one of those. Well, there is, well, there is a lot of term, <laughs> turnover, actually, so we're going to have new press secretaries coming into play yeah. in autumn. So. Um, maybe there might it be a witch there. hunt. There might <laughs> yeah. be a witch hunt behind the scenes. You know, who's who's the leaker? Mm. Oh my goodness! When are you? When are you three going to write your royal books? Your royal oh, titles? God. 
Well, I don't think anybody's got, and, and nobody's got any time. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on, because, Kate, it's been nearly a year, I can't believe it, actually, since you broke the Cash for Honours scandal involving Prince Charles's charities. And I know. A report last week suggests that the police don't seem particularly in a hurry to investigate. Well, it's hard to believe it's been a year, isn't it, since we published that letter, which was the kind of bombshell letter from Michael Fawcett, which said... Oh, we will help this Saudi tycoon get British citizenship. We can help him get a knighthood. Um, and that letter's been at the heart of this Metropolitan Police investigation. As we know, Michael Fawcett, um, Prince Charles's right-hand man for so many years, had to step down as a result of this. Um, and there are stories that this had kind of gone into the long grass. Now, I was speaking to somebody at the police recently, a contact, who was saying, what you have to understand about these things is that they're incredibly complex. We're talking about money that was coming from overseas into a foundation. Um, some money went missing. There's lots of things to, for them to investigate. Richard, do you think this is smacks of a bit of a case of, oh, let's just hang on in there and just pretend nothing's going on until it's gone away. I mean, that is the impression you get, isn't yeah. it? I mean, what I'd like to see happen is them addressing the whole question of whether it's wise to have these charities, you know, this huge charity empire where they need the millions coming in. And we've seen, they published figures this week for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's foundation, and they've been brilliant in terms of fundraising, but that means there's a lot of rich individuals who are handing over money mm. and then you feel the need to keep it up they should be just patrons of save the children or oxfam or whatever and and then leave all that side of things fundraising to the charities i, I just don't think it's a a healthy route to go down but i have to say there's no sign of that happening well, as what, I said are the, the, oh, families, what are the royal families without their charities I mean, no, that's but sort I, of think Richard, I think their, their Richard's point is they could patronise other charities without, without yeah. founding them. And that's what yeah. I said in the paper. You know, I did an opinion piece recently saying exactly the same thing that, you know, if Charles creates a charity, it's something that he decides the country or the world needs. But actually, perhaps it should be more listening mode, looking at the charities already out there and meeting needs that already exist in the community, not ones that he's decided. Mm. That, that, that you need to support. I mean, it would be a big thing because he's put so much time and effort into establishing this network of charities which do great work. Um, so to give that up would be a big thing. But, you know, he is going to become king and he will have to give things up. And I think they should just... Well, I'm afraid. I think they should close them down. Well, he's done that with the, he's done that really well with the Prince's Trust, which has done some incredible work with young people yeah. getting jobs, opportunities, skills, and that sort of thing. And now, pretty much, just runs itself. You know, mm. um, the Prince goes to visit, and it's 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 very much its own entity, and starting up all around the world. So I think that is a great kind of blueprint. Yeah, that would be the that, way to go. That they ought to do with the rest of his charities. Yeah. It's fascinating, but let's move on, because Charlotte, the Duchess of Cambridge, I want to just discuss briefly, received an honour this week from a magazine that she hasn't always enjoyed the most harmonious relationship with. Well, I think Tatler and the Royals go hand in hand, but there was an incident two years there ago was. when Tatler yeah. wrote actually a very insightful and um, yeah. in some ways very flattering piece about Kate. But Except the bits where it was really <laughs> deeply unflattering. But they did veer onto the territory <laughs> yeah. of her mother Carol, which I think is yeah. actually the really sensitive issue here. I mean, they're, they're, they're clearly very touchy about anything to do with Carol and her upbringing and her being upper middle class, as the piece said. But, but also um, saying that William had basically... T appointed Carol as like an unofficial mother. I remember that. Yeah, bit as well. I think that's quite a flattering thing to say. I think it's lovely to love your mother-in-law, but anyway, it was a touchy subject. It got them in a bit of trouble. And clearly um, now Kate is kind of back in the pages of Tatler because she got their number one best dress. Yes, so and let's... it's incredibly flattering, the article. Well, should we have a look and see some of the looks that got Kate that gong this year?
of Cambridge showing there why she's been named as Tatler magazine's best dressed for 2022. What's wrong with us? Where are we on the list? Goodness me, but from a future queen to the present one now and Kate, Her Majesty has arrived in Balmoral with less of the fanfare than she usually receives. Yeah, she would normally have a kind of inspection of the guard, um, it'll be public and when she moves from, you know, her normal lodgings into the, the main castle. But that didn't happen this year and it was down to the Queen's comfort, they said. Uh, so we didn't even see any pictures, it all took place behind the scenes. But yeah. I'm told that she definitely will leave Balmoral, or certainly intends to leave Balmoral, to come down to see in the new Prime Minister when that happens at the oh, beginning yes, of, of September. Course. So she would normally stay uh, until kind of early October at Balmoral, but she's going to break her holiday, that's the plan, come down, say goodbye to Boris, invite the new Prime Minister um, to form a government and welcome them in, and no doubt then go back to Scotland. Um, so not, not a usual break as such, um, a, a sign that they are considering the Queen's comfort, but behind the scenes there's this message I'm still doing the job. Um, it's one of the kind of personal prerogatives, as it's called, of the Queen to invite the new Prime Minister to form a government. She very much intends to do that in person, if possible, at Buckingham Palace. Mm. Um, so it's a kind of mixed messages, you know, they're considering her comfort, but all the while saying she's still doing the job. What she a, probably really wants kill. to do it. She probably wants to welcome I, the new well, Prime Minister and thinking, say goodbye to Boris. I was thinking, what a buzzkill to have to break your holiday to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, but a lorry full of furniture arrived the other day, apparently. Do we, can we assume that it's all about that's keeping her comfortable up there? I think so. I think, you know, there's been plans put in place already. We've been told there's a, a sort of stair lift, um, a Craigowan Lodge where the Queen likes to stay when she's not in the main castle. Um, so I think everything's been di done. I mean, she's 96, as we all know, and good. I'm yeah. glad that she's been made comfortable, frankly. Mm. And it's good if you can take your favourite bits of furniture on holiday, isn't it? You know, <laughs> I'm sure we'd like to, you know, take our favourite armchair or something. To... I feel like we've taken our <laughs> holiday as it is without all that. Yeah. <laughs> She has got her kitchen own train. Sink. Why not take the piano and the kitchen sink and everything else? Yeah, yeah and especially when you don't have to move it. Somebody else yeah. takes care of that. Easy. But Richard, someone else who may need to move some furniture soon. The Duchess of York, apparently, according <gasps> to reports, she has agreed to buy a, a Mayfair mansion. It's, it says mansion here. What, what can you tell us? Well, it is apparently, you know, almost £7 million. So I think that definitely qualifies as a... It's a mansion in my yeah. book. Or a maisonette. Uh, <laughs> God, you don't get much for £7 yeah. million in Mayfair you these really days. You really don't. That's why I'm wondering if it really does qualify as a But, you know, yeah. as we know with Fergie, there's always something new. There's always something going on. And this is... Um, she's bought these properties apparently as an investment um, for their daughters, Princess Beatrice and Eugenie. But it, it caused outrage among a socialite who um, had sold them the, um, her chalet oh, yeah. in, in the Swiss Alps. And she'd eventually agreed a lower price on the basis she thought they were struggling for money and, and she thought that Prince Andrew might go to prison in America anyway. We ought to say here that he was never going to go to prison. It was a civil case. Yeah. But this woman seemed to be under great pressure and she was, she's outraged that suddenly Fergie's found these millions. And Charlotte, a lot of people will be asking where that money comes from. I know that you have a theory about this. I have a theory. I can't actually tell you because oh, we can't trust man. Richard Eden. But, <laughs> I, not I, to I speak quite me. understand. I'll put yeah. it in my column tomorrow. Yeah. But, no, but, but uh, listen, the deeds aren't out for another six months and I just wouldn't be surprised if Sarah Ferguson's name wasn't the only name on the deeds. I shall say no more. <laughs> I mean, surely they must realise, Kate, that this is going to be scrutinised to the high hilt. Well, absolutely. It wasn't so long ago that Fergie was doing a deal to pay just, I think, 10p in the pound to all her debtors. So there's lots of people she owed money to. They did a deal that she wouldn't pay them back the full amount. They'll now be thinking, hang on a minute, I wasn't paid the full amount that you mm. owed me, and all of a sudden you've millions in the bank to be able to afford this sort of investment property. Maybe she got lucky on the scratch cards. <laughs> yeah, we'll blame think? her. Yeah. Could possibly be. She Can you imagine? She could possibly be tapping up her <laughs> wealthy friends again. I mean, it's just... It's well, it, it seems to be her friends were keen to suggest that it was the success of her books. You know, she's been busy writing um, sort of Mills and Boone That's right, yeah. type books. How many copies did she sell of those? a big deal. But um, I think with Sarah, it all says to me of Sarah Ferguson, she's such a survivor. You know, everything that she's come through, I mean, you yeah. have to hand it to her. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's incredible. Actually, it's quite a nice thing she's doing. She's trying to leave a nest egg for her daughters. It's just that she doesn't have a, an egg to nest. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Richard, 
When I ask you this, please be assured it's not because I hate you, but put yourself in the shoes of Fergie's <laughs> advisors for a second. Who would want that? But what would your advice be to her at this juncture? I can't offer Fergie advice. You know, I, I need to take advice from Fergie. You know, any, any, anyone who can write some rather obscure books and make enough money to be buying a seven million pounds house, you know, she ought to be giving financial advice in the coming, you know, crisis we've, we've got job, here. Richard. Exactly. So, um, no, I think the only sensible advice would be, as she's doing, would be to try and keep your distance from your um, estranged husband. Um, Lee said soonest mended when it comes to Princess yeah, Andrew. Do you think she would listen to that one? I don't know. No, she's, she's been anyway, incredibly loyal. Hasn't it's she? probably best mm. we're ending there. That is all we have time for this week. My thanks, huge thanks to Charlotte Griffiths, Kate Mansey, Richard Eden, and to you, of course, for watching. We'll see you next Thursday. Bye bye.